Claudie. Is Claudie here? Yeah, Claudie's here. She's up. So Claudie uh, Sheehan uh, comes from LSU. And Claudie, we're going to keep going right through this afternoon. There's no break. So if you need coffee, just go out and do it. And Claudie's going to talk about moving on the Dallas access session, catheter placement and management. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay. So uh, good afternoon. So we're going to talk about dialysis catheters. Uh, we're going to try to make it interesting. All right, got it now. Okay, so the uh, internal jugular vein, as you know, runs uh, the majority of its course. It's running directly posterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. There is, at the insertion of the SCM muscle, there is a, there are two heads, as you know, the uh, two heads of the uh, sternoclavicular muscle, sternocleidom muscle, sternocleidomastoid muscle. I'll have to edit that out for the redo. Um, but basically, by turning the head to the side, that opens up those, those two heads of the SCM muscle very nicely to expose a window. And there, that window allows you to gain access to the vein without having a tunnel through a muscle, which makes this the ideal location to place a tunnel dialysis catheter. So again, here is a little depiction of that window between the two heads of the SCM muscle. And you can see the diagram where you can see the needle going. And it's important when you do this that you access towards the ipsilateral nipple. I know everybody always talks about that. It's in the textbooks, but it's an essential point. It's a critical point. It allows you to gain access to the vein without puncturing the artery, the carotid artery, which is lying right there as well. So there are a number of uh, considerations in trying to pick where you're going to pick your dialysis catheter. The right IJ vein is the best. And you can see in this diagram why that would be. It's a fairly straight line down the internal jugular vein into the anomenate into the SVC, as opposed to the left. Uh, IJ vein, which there are two, if I can demonstrate here, there are two actual acute turns right here, and so that makes it a little bit more challenging. Um, and here is a depiction of one that is even a more acute angle. So in doing this, it's important to know your anatomy in terms of trying to figure out where your catheter is if it's not obvious. Again, the left IJ being the more challenging of these two axes. So in this picture, you see a picture of an SVC stenosis. So when the superior vena cava becomes stenotic, Obviously, collaterals develop in response to that to allow for venous drainage. And so this is one depiction of what can happen. Who, anybody know what this vein is here? Yes, that's the azagous vein. And so a very large azagous vein can be misleading for the SVC if you're not paying attention. This is a little diagram of the accessory hemiazagous and the azagous veins. And so it's just important to keep those in mind. Now, in terms of how many patients should be maintained with dialysis catheters, less than 10% of all dialysis patients should be maintained with a chronic dialysis, tunnel dialysis catheter. And this specifically is defined by a patient who is using the catheter for three months or more, and they don't have a maturing fistula in place. So less than 10% of all patients should be. And this is a busy looking slide, but it's taken right out of the guidelines. So, and it, this you don't have to really read. It's again pretty busy right out of the guidelines, but the bottom line is you can use a tunnel dialysis catheter in place of, uh, for dialysis basically in almost any setting. The only time where you might not use a tunnel dialysis catheter and use a direct dialysis catheter would be if you're using it just for a few days. But even for a few days, a tunnel dialysis catheter is appropriate. So fact, there are 30,000 deaths every year due to improper catheter management causing vein injury and exsanguination. So this is not true, actually. My husband thought it would be funny, and it would be a good idea to wake you up. So if you, th <laughs> so if you went along with it, you weren't being into it. The, and I, I get no credit for that. The, uh, so this is just a little depiction of what it looks like, your temporary dialysis catheter versus your tunnel dialysis catheter. And medical students will often, and, and medical doctors will often mistake the picture there on the right, the tunnel catheter as being a subclavian catheter. I often hear that as there's a subclavian dialysis catheter in place. And the subclavian is naturally never an appropriate choice for a tunnel dialysis catheter. So when you see it coming out there, you simply feel your catheter and you can palpate. And, you know, that way you can tell exactly where it's going in. So there's really no current proven advantage of one catheter design over another. There are many different designs and they all seem to be equivocal. But the bottom line is there are a number of complications, carotid puncture, pneumothorax, we know about these. Even catheter infection is something to consider, but we can deal with that. But the one thing you can't deal with with catheters, the biggest complication that we all fear that will happen over time is, uh, is central vein occlusion. And so this is exactly what will happen, no doubt, over time if you leave catheters in long enough. 
So it's very important, every time I see a patient, I talk to them about why catheters are bad. They need to know because they think it would be quite fine with them, a lot of them, that they just live with the catheter. So all patients, it's ethically responsible on our part to talk to them about transplant options or, or at least long-term fistula and, and AV access. So the preferred site I mentioned earlier is the right IJ vein. The least preferred site is the femoral. You can use, you should use ultrasound guided access in an emergency, maybe not, but other than that, it's pretty much standard of care at this point to use ultrasound guided access, and it's important to use your ultrasound when you guide the access. So many people will see their needle at the superficial aspect of that picture and think that they, that's directing them down to the vein, whereas in fact the needle has now passed out of the beam of the ultrasound and they're no longer actually using their ultrasound. So you have to actually use the ultrasound, really see your needle going into the vein, and then you have no worries about any type of unplanned injuries. And you can use a needle without a syringe. These patients have enough venous pressure where you will get back bleeding. So an important step that should always happen is you want to place a guide wire down, way down into the IVC. This is particularly important for the left IJ vein because of those turns that you're going to get. You may even need a stiff one, need to exchange your wire out for a stiff wire. And if you're at that point, a little tidbit, if you're at that point where you may be losing wire access and you don't want to and this is a difficult case, you can always place a sheath or a four French dilator in to maintain your access and exchange out for a stiffer wire. Now this slide is about not exactly keeping the wire loose, but the push and pull technique, right? So the push and pull technique is particularly important for very large sheaths going in veins that take turns. So in using that wire, you advance your catheter while pulling back on your wire. So it's very important. You put your wire far down in the IVC so that as you're advancing that dilator, you're pulling back on your wire and you can afford to lose a little bit of wire access. If you don't do that, the catheter and the sheath is gonna go where it wants to go, the direction that you're pushing in, which is not the direction you want it to go in. So you really have to do this push and pull technique. You probably already do it, you don't even realize it, but that is essential to the procedure, otherwise you're much more likely to get an injury. So where do we put our catheter tip? At the SVC right atrial junction. An approximate estimate of where this is is the right tracheobronchial border as is depicted here, that's a rough approximate. If you want to put it a little further into the right atrium, that's okay. The, all right, so again, like I mentioned earlier, watch for the azygous vein. This is a picture of the anatomy here where you can see how somebody could be fooled by placing a wire down there and thinking that they're in the SVC. So this is a picture of a tip of the catheter in the azygous vein. This is not a good enough access. The azygous vein is a collateral and it can provide a lot of collateral flow, but it's not gonna be high enough flow for ideal dialysis access. So ideally a tip in the azygous vein is not gonna be good enough, even if you get return. So can anybody tell me what they think is going on here? Or where is your catheter here? Where's your wire? I heard it somewhere, it's the hemiazygous vein. And so this is okay, and you can see in this one, this catheter went from the hemiazygous vein back up the azygous and then into the SVC. So do you think this is an acceptable placement of a catheter? It's actually fine, yes. As long as the tip of the catheter and the two end, end holes are in a high flow vein, which in this case is in the SVC, you're gonna be okay. So this is actually surprising an okay placement. And again, this is the anatomic depiction of, you can see it, you can trace it down through the azygous up into the azygous and into the SVC. So that's pretty cool. Femoral catheters, they have to be long enough so that you're in the straight portion of the IVC. So you don't want to be here in this picture here. You can see where the, the catheter has an angle. So the tip of it is touching the side wall of the IVC. So you really need to find a way for, for that catheter to be straight. Otherwise, you know you're going to form thrombus and stenosis pretty early on. When you tunnel, you want to tunnel slightly laterally, not inferiorly or interiorly, because you're much more likely to get a kink. Now, this picture may, be total, may not be totally representative of how that catheter looks. You'd have to get an oblique to really see if it really is kink, but most likely that catheter was tunneled a little too anteriorly, and there's likely to be a kink there. You can exchange these catheters over wires. Generally speaking, this should be at least a two-week-old catheter or longer so that you have a nice tunnel created there. Uh, you want to use two wires and it's uh, fairly easy. You want to make sure your wires are in the IVC. I usually use two super stiff, uh, two actually stiff angle glide wires. It works fine. So 
The complications, so in addition to SVC or central vein stenosis, you also get this. If you've ever dealt with catheters, you know it doesn't work, you get a call, my catheter's not working, it's clotting up, and you shoot a little venogram, and you get this. And anybody know what this is? It's very common. This is a fibrin sheath that you get around a catheter. So you almost, get, you get a new lumen inside your central vein. So this lumen, if you were at, to actually access that innominate vein or the SVC from the groin, you wouldn't get into that lumen necessarily. You might get into the normal lumen, which would be probably larger than that. So this is a fibrin sheath that covers your catheter. And so if you keep exchanging your catheter in that same sheath over time, you're going to get the same result. The catheter is just not going to last very long. It'll start clotting because you don't have a large enough lumen. So the treatment for this is to balloon angioplasty. So you have to recognize that you're in that. And you have to go very high pressures with non-compliant balloons. But you can treat this stenosis, and then you can see here there's an example where you get a very nice outcome, and then your catheter can continue to be placed in that location. You don't have to lose that access. This is a case, you know, patients come in with pacemaker leads. They're naturally, over time, most likely going to create some stenosis just based on where they are in the vein. And so, again, you can balloon angioplasty around these pacemaker leads and basically pretend they're not there. You're going to get some improvement. You may get a more frequent recurrence, but you can balloon around them. And this is uh, just a little depiction of the infection protocol for catheters. And the bottom line is with this, you know, you're going to treat with antibiotics. Exit site infections are not necessarily going to be requiring a new site. But tunnel infections, you're going to have to find a new tunnel. Now, that doesn't mean you have to abandon your site. You can just retunnel it through a different tunnel and do a fancy thing where you cut down and pull your wires through something differently. If you've ever been on a case like that, you know what I'm talking about. But basically, an exit site infection is not as bad as a tunnel infection. Bacteremic infection, you know, we, we know how to treat those. You have to remove it and find a new site, basically. Um, and an obvious point, you know, surgeons who have placed more than 50 catheters a year have significantly fewer complications. This is intuitive. You know, the more you do, the better you're going to be. There are subtle nuances to the procedure that, you know, if you're doing it all the time, you can uh, anticipate the complications and avoid them. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs>